All right, so, so welcome everybody to the midway point uh, in our seminar series on Islam and biomedicine. Uh, for most of you in the room, uh, familiar faces, I am Asim Padella. I am a visiting fellow here this term at the Oxford Center. And this series, as you know, is uh, a collaboration between uh, OSIS, Dr. Afifi, and myself at the Initiative of Islam and Medicine at the University of Chicago, and is underwritten by the Templeton Foundation. So we're actually exactly at the midway point, uh, and we have another four seminars to go. Uh, today, we are privileged to have a double header, so to speak, of people outside of our circle. Uh, we both have the speaker, who I'll introduce in a second, and the respondent, both coming to us from outside our circle of Oxford. So uh, to begin with, uh, as you know, today, the advertisement is about uh, Dr. Asim Yusuf, who's going to present to us uh, a very interesting title on paper, but that C has changed. Um, but he was supposed to speak on, I told him uh, speak on. Uh, the mad, the sad, the, glad, the bad, and the glad towards an Islamic conception of mental illness and well-being, vice, and virtue, and something about being uh, by the heart. Uh, he is a consultant psychiatrist uh, here uh, and is part of the Royal Kyle College of Psychiatrists. Um, he did his uh, uh, medical training at the um, uh, University of Natal in South Africa. And his Islamic studies training has been actually in various places, in both in Africa and, and here. Um, so uh, we sh uh, don't need to kind of go through that, but he had had some formal Islamic seminary training as well. And presently, he runs a little institute, or maybe it's big now, uh, uh, a modest institute uh, for traditional Islamic sciences. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that as well. You bridge many different worlds for all of us. Uh, and our respondent, I will introduce him now, but it's uh, Dr. Peter Petkoff. He comes to us from the Regents Park College. He's a director of Law, Religion, and International Relations program there. Uh, and many of you should know he runs a very esteemed journal. I like the, uh, uh, the, the things that I was able to see, the Oxford Journal of Law and Religion. So he will be responding to some of the comments and ideas that you present today. Uh, with that, I will let uh, leave the floor to you to uh, give us an enlightening and illuminating talk. Thank you, Dr. Thank Austin. you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to extend, first of all, uh, uh, a thanks to, a heartfelt thanks, really, to the Centre for uh, the Oxford Centre here, to Dr. Asim Padella, to Sheikh Hafifi, and the others, uh, faculty members, uh, for inviting me and honouring me, really, uh, with the opportunity to address all of you today. Um, I am, in fact, going to talk about the man that's and the, whatever it was. <laughs> Um, which, was, which was a title, which was obviously, as you can imagine, a title not quite thought up on the hoof, uh, but um, hopefully will reflect um, some of the things that I'd like to address. And these are really ideas in, in Genesis form, uh, so I would really welcome your input into them. Uh, it's something that I have obviously been involved with for quite some time as a jobbing psychiatrist uh, working, in, uh, working in Wolverhampton as well as in Birmingham places that have a very, high, um, uh, a very high load in terms of mental health, and especially a very high load in terms of ethnic minority mental health. Um, and as someone who, both through my professional work as well as through <coughs> my, um, my religious duties, has often been asked the question about the Islamic approach to mental illness and mental wellness. Um, this is, of course, part of a series on biomedicine, uh, and one of the most difficult aspects, generally speaking, of biomedicine is, in fact, mental health. Uh, for reasons that we will take a look at as I go through the presentation. Now, some of it will be some of it will be uh, discussed on the slides, but most of it I'll just I'll just I'll just talk it through to you, really, uh, given that these are pretty. Uh, pretty new ideas from my perspective, they may not be from your perspective, and if that's not, then that's great, I'd like to hear more about them. So I've come here really as much to learn as I have to impart anything. Um, I was giving a presentation like this once to uh, a bunch of my colleagues, and um, I asked a question. I said, uh, what do we treat, we psychiatrists? What's the thing that we treat? And that prompted a debate that lasted an hour and a half. That was slide number one. And I never moved past slide number one because it prompted an hour and a half long debate about what is it that a psychiatrist actually treats. Because what we're supposed to treat, what's on our job title, 
is the mind. We deal with mental illness. We aren't neurologists. We don't treat the brain, per se. But what is the mind? And the question of philosophy of mind, of the subject matter that we endeavour to repair, is one that is unsatisfactorily dealt with, shall we say, in training. On the way down here, I actually took the opportunity to find a friend of mine who's just finished his exams, so he knows this stuff a lot better than I do, as you tend to do after, after you finish your exams. And I said, tell me, um, what do we treat? And he said, uh, what do you mean? And I said, well, you treat mental illness. He said, yeah, illness of what? Illness of the mind. Where's that? Is it the brain? No, I had a patient once. And the patient said, oh, I don't like all this mental guff, all nonsense. I like my stuff concrete and material. What do you do? And I said, I'm a micro-neurologist. He said, what do you mean? He said, I treat, the, I treat lesions of the brain that cannot be picked up on MRI scans. I mean, the problems that I treat are too small to be detected by imaging. And he said, oh, all right, then that's fine. I'll go for it. I had another colleague once, a professor of mine, who said, um, how does paracetamol work? I said, well, it's a receptor in the brain, and it blocks the receptor, and the pain goes away. He said, right. How does uh, an antipsychotic work? I said, well, it's a receptor in the brain, and the medication blocks the receptor, and psychosis goes away. And he said, okay, why does paracetamol take an hour to work, but an antipsychotic take three weeks? And he said, he said, he said do you really think it's that simple? And I said, well, I did. I said, you just said that right now. Um, now, I said, okay, so what do we treat? And he said, I don't know. I know it's got something to do with the brain, because medication works. I know it's something more than just neuronal processes, because talking works. But I don't know what it is that we actually treat. The second important question is mental illness. What do you mean by an illness? When does sadness become depression? When does suspiciousness become paranoia? <coughs> and what, when does happiness, for that matter, become mania? Or impulsiveness become mania? What are the points at which we draw a distinction between the pathological and the non-pathological? And who makes those judgment calls? When are you just sad? When do you need to be treated for it? When do you just need TLC? <coughs> when do you need an antipsychotic? And the third interesting point that comes up here, I think uh, 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 Dr. Met Dr. Metcalf, is that if I got that? Petkoff. Petkoff, Petkoff. I apologize. Uh, might, might be interested in this one, is, is the notion of the medicalization of criminality. So one of the hot topics in psychiatry is that psychiatrists are now being asked to treat psychopathy. So if a person is diagnosed with a dangerous and severe personality disorder and is liable to violence against other people and so forth, and this is violence not because of a psychosis or because of a mania, i.e. it is not inadvertent, it is done in full Full with full capacity. But that is shown to be the result of a particular type of disorder in the brain. <coughs> should that person go to jail or should they go to a hospital? If they go to a hospital, <coughs> what am I supposed to do with them? How do I help that person? Is there a linkage between the order and disorder of the mind stroke brain and the ethical decisions that we take. Hence, virtue and vice, happiness and sadness. We, one, of the, one of the most difficult things to treat in psychiatry is a personality disorder. And a personality disorder, effectively, is, is not, not, not nice to be diagnosed with a personality disorder because I'm effectively saying there's something wrong with your personality. Uh, what does that mean? What it means is the coping mechanisms that you have for processing adverse events are such that they lead to worsening of those, to worse consequences 
rather than ameliorating those consequences. It's about the decisions that you take and the consequences that those decisions have. It's about how you take decisions, how you respond to emotional triggers. And there are a number of ways of looking at personality disorders. The uh, most famous and the pithiest among them is the mad, the bad, and the sad. There are personality disorders that are linked to isolation, lo loss of confidence, like dependent personality disorder and so forth. There are those that are linked to suspiciousness and eccentricity, like a paranoid personality or a schizoid <coughs> personality. And then there are those that are linked to criminality so, or a lack of empathy for others, such as an antisocial or dissocial personality disorder and an emotionally unstable personality disorder. There seems to be, even in the vocabulary of psychiatry, an inbuilt <coughs> notion of ethics. So, as in, in, the, in the sense that ethics comes down to decision making. And it's decision making from a moral basis, i.e. what are the consequences of this action for myself, and what are the consequences of this action for other people? <coughs> Which of those two things do I, uh, do I give precedence to? in any particular decision. So, we'll have a little bit of a look at it, but <coughs> language. So, psyche and yatros. Now, I translated psyche as soul there, the anima, the thing that makes you you. But with that translation, again, depending on what we mean by that, with that translation, of course, uh, psychiatry means to heal the soul, <coughs> not the mind insofar as the mind is considered to be different from the soul, and certainly not the brain. And psychology is the study of the soul. And the question that I have, and the, 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 I suppose the, the idea I want to put out there, really, is given that this topic, the philosophy of psychiatry, you might say, the philosophy of health in general, is not something that clinicians tend to think about. What is the model that we are utilizing when we, when we approach a particular <coughs> topic in medicine, any field of medicine. Generally speaking, medicine operates on a, on a Cartesian principle, the principle of Cartesian duality. There is the body, which is a machine, <coughs> or a car, and there is the mind, or the soul, which is the driver. At birth, or at conception, or wherever you like, the driver gets into the car, at death, the driver leaves the car, Right? But there is a separation between body and soul. The medic treats the body. We are basically mechanics. You've got a problem and you pull in to get it fixed. Your spark plugs <coughs> need changing, we can sort that out for you. You've got a hole in your exhaust pipe, we can sort that out for you. All right. <coughs> However, one of the reasons that psychiatry is a bit of a Cinderella sign, a bit of a Cinderella uh, discipline in medicine is that it's not entirely clear what exactly it is that we're treating. There's no bit of the body except for the brain. Except for the brain itself. And the brain is a deeply complicated thing. So are we operating on the principle in Western medicine that the mind <coughs> is the production of the brain? Or that the mind is something separate but connected to the brain. Right? This is not entirely clear, although most medics will go along the lines, and it certainly in, in practice, it works, along the, it works on, the, uh, on the position that we are basically treating the brain. You start speaking to a psychologist and they will give you a very different answer to that question. Right? They will not start talking <coughs> about you having a deficit of this neuro or neuro and uh, um, this uh, neurotransmitter and an excess of that neurotransmitter, they will talk about trauma. So the first question I asked, I would ask is what do we treat? What are we treating? The second question is what is the pathogenesis of a mental illness? How do we get schizophrenia? What's the cause, to put that even simple, what's the cause of schizophrenia? Now, I've been a psychiatrist for 15 years, I don't know the answer to that question. And I've never met anybody who knows the answer to that question. I've heard of hypotheses. I've heard of models. 
But the models are both mutually exclusive and seem to work equally well. <coughs> so there is a biological model. And the biological model basically is that, well, schizophrenia is the deficit or the uh, excess of dopamine in certain areas of the brain. Certain types of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, in certain areas of the brain. Reduce the amount of dopamine, sort it. Right? You speak to a psychologist, they will say, no, 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 no. Schizophrenia is a trauma response. It, 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 it develops in relationship to a trauma that is experienced in childhood. And it manifests in this way and this way. And they have various formulation, formulations and models to explain that. You speak to a social worker, or a particularly clued up social worker anyway, and they will say, no, you're both wrong. Schizophrenia is a socially constructed illness. It is the result of life circumstances, society, alienation, and so forth. The weird thing is that if each of those three people applied their models and developed a system of management on the basis of that model, they would have roughly, and I do say roughly, although I'm a psychiatrist, I meant to get for my guys, but roughly similar rates of success. Right? How is an illness like schizophrenia treated in the developing world where they don't have olanzapine and clozapine and all these medications, the fancy medications that we have now? It is treated basically with TLC. It's treated by the family rallying around, giving that person support. Outcomes for schizophrenia in the developing world still are better in the developing world than they are in the developed world. And that is with very little access to medication. Yes, those that don't improve do much worse. Definitely. But there are many, many more people that don't improve to a functional level um, in, in, the, in the developed <coughs> world. And that's why these problems are on the increase. If you look at something like personality disorders, they are absolutely on the increase. They are, I would suggest, anecdotally and speaking to colleagues, the biggest inpatient load in mental health is patients not with psychosis or with bipolar, but with personality disorder. I, when I work on the wards, half of my patients are, do not technically have an Axis I mental illness. They have personality disorders. All right? How does one go about dealing with a situation like this? Well, where does, where does Islam come into this? <coughs> well, if the question is, what are we treating? And we accept, <coughs> from a Muslim perspective, so what I'm going to try to do is give you an indigenous, native Muslim response to the, quest, to the question of the ontology of the soul. What is it that we are actually treating? From an Islamic perspective, it is understood to be the soul. Now, what do we mean by the soul? That's a very interesting question. And what I'm going to do is take you through, um, how can I put it, a... <coughs> A number of views of how the soul, a number of views of how the, the, way, the way the soul is viewed from an Islamic perspective. Once we have a clear idea of what it is that we're treating, and I will try to do this, uh, you, you need to give me clear updates about time because. 20. 20 minutes, okay, let me 20, just 25. jump into this then. <coughs> what we have um, from an Islamic perspective is a relatively clear idea about what the soul is uh, in, its, in its reality, its precise relationship to the human body, which is not what you might think, uh, as well as some of the components that have constructed it. Now these questions have come up, or these discussions have arisen from uh, an Islamic perspective, not in the context of um, mental illness or mental health, but rather in the context of the perfection of the soul, in the cultivation of ethics, in the science of tezkiyah, or tasawwuf, the purification of the soul. It's not about, generally, the writings on this are not about getting you from minus one to zero, they're about getting you from zero to hero. That's, and, and so one of the difficulties that we have is actually trying to just take it 
take this, which is the ideally the creation of the insan al kamil, the perfect human being, or the perfected human, the insan al kamil, the perfected human being, and bringing it around to the other side and looking at how a human being becomes damaged. How does the psyche become damaged? And what, given the nature of the thing that has been damaged, how does one go about repairing it? How does one go about healing it? <coughs> so this is what I'd like to do. Now, um, I, I use the analogy sometimes of an X when, when talking about these, uh, these questions. The, uh, the X, like this, it represents different origins, different purposes, but a common ground in the middle. So if you look at a model, uh, if you look at a Western or a secular model of mental health and mental, mental health and well-being and illness, you look at an Islamic model of mental health well, uh, and well-being and, and illness, what you have are two different models of the origin. Where does the thing come from? The mind, the soul, the psyche, where does it come from? Two, different no two very different notions about its purpose and the ultimate outcome. But an area in the middle where they come together <coughs> and you can and you can and, and, and there can be a cross fertilization uh, where each can enrich the other's understanding. Now a great example of this in practice is mindfulness. Mindfulness is the sexiest form of therapy that there is. It's the thing. Everyone wants to do mindfulness. Alright? What is mindfulness? It is fundamentally a Buddhist meditative practice that has been stripped of its theology and the skill has been applied because that clearly demonstrates benefits to the, to the participants. All right? You have that. The other, the second sexiest therapy is compassion-focused therapy. Compassion-focused therapy, which is also a Buddhist meditative technique <coughs> shown to have clear benefits for those who for those for those who applied whether or not you accept the theology behind it and that's the critical point from an Islamic understanding the human soul is first one must understand that the human being is exceptional in in terms of God's creation the human being <coughs> is considered to be something exceptional Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ God has honoured human beings. Um, when, I look, when I talk to some of my students, I say that, what is it that's special about human beings? They say, well, that's easy. I say, what? Well, we have knowledge, and we have will, and we have the ability to gain knowledge. We have the ability to take decisions. We have the ability to actual, actualise those decisions. And I said, every living thing from an amoeba up has the ability to do that. That's the de what you've just given me is the definition of life. An amoeba can sense what is harmful to it, can choose to move away from it, and then can actually move away from it. It can sense <coughs> what is beneficial to it, it can choose to acquire it, and it can actually acquire it. Trees do this, animals do this. What is particular about human beings? What is particular about the decision-making of human beings? And one of the very interesting answers that, you know, that I'm pondering to this question is that we exist consciously in time. One of the differences in the development of the human brain between animals and, uh, and, and, and human beings is the development of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is where memories are stored, effectively. It's, the, it's kind of the, the, the whole circuit, the hippocampal circuit, is really a memory pathway. The idea that you begin to remember things, and a child only starts to do this around the age of about two years old. That's why you take a you take a six year six month old baby or a three month old baby, and you do the boo the boo test. You know, you kind of go boo like that, yeah, and the baby gets really surprised and shocked. And every time you do it, the baby gets shocked. <laughs> why? Because every time you do it, it's the first time for that child. The baby has not yet laid down memory pathways such that they can understand this person is the same person that did it the last time. Once you have an understanding of the past, you can construct an understanding of the future. Once you can construct an understanding of the future, you can now take instinctual benefit-harm decisions 
and look at them over a period of time. You can learn from the past because you can remember it. And you can apply that knowledge going forward. And hence, if you ask a four, a three-year-old child, would you like one sweet now or two sweets later? The child will always take the one sweet now. If you ask a five-year-old child, do you want one sweet now or two sweets later? That five-year-old, most five-year-olds will say, I'll take two sweets later. If you ask a five-year-old, would you like one sweet now or two sweets tomorrow? They'll say, no, I'll take the one sweet now. Why? They can't go that far forward in time. Ask a nine-year-old, one sweet now or two sweets tomorrow? They'll wait for tomorrow, but they won't wait for next week. And so what you find is the more you can, the more understanding of time, a life in time that you have, the more far-reaching your decisions become. The more you are able to extrapolate benefit and harm going forward. That's about human exceptionalism. I'm going to skip through uh, to look at the soul itself. What do we, when we talk about the Islamic perception of <coughs> the soul? So the soul, from a Muslim perspective, the one, of the, one of the first things one has to understand is that this is a question that people were asking even then. It was a question asked to <coughs> the Blessed Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, tell us about the soul. The response that came in Revelation is the soul is a mystery of your Lord and you have only been given a little knowledge about it. However, we have been given some knowledge about it. What do we know? We know that the soul is, metaphorically speaking, the breath of God. It is something that is linked to the divine. What is the purpose of the soul? The purpose of the soul is to know God. So that's, its, that's what it's there for. It's there to know God. What has it been, what happened, what is, shall we, talk about, shall we talk about the psychogenesis of the soul? Let's take a psychological approach to this and look at the idea of early life experiences impacting on the present day. What is the earliest experience of the soul? The earliest experience of the soul is the vision of God, the alast, that the soul comes face to face with God. There is an original Adamic soul, which is awakened by God, or the soul is breathed into that being by God. It is awakened by God, and it is taught by God. It is given knowledge of all the names, a famously mysterious, a famously mysterious verse right at the beginning of the Quran. <coughs> we taught Adam all the names. All right. So there is this initial experience. We, of, of Adam, the primordial soul. Then you have the awakening of the souls where they come and they encounter God. You then have a stage where the souls enter a period where they are effectively in a waiting room, waiting to be infused into a body. And at that point of infusion, which occurs between 80 and 120 days in Islamic theology, of the fetus, at that point... From that point onwards, the soul is never again permanently separated from a body. The soul is embodied from that point onwards. And the idea of embodiment is a very, very important one. We are not the driver, <coughs> and the body is not the car. We are hardwired into it. The relationship between brain and soul is an integral relationship. It is not the relationship between your keyboard and your fingers. It is an integral relationship. Integral in such a way that the not just does the soul affect the body, i.e. actions <coughs> that you perform and decisions that you take and so forth, but the body affects the soul. Hence, what you do has an impact on your soul. It is a feedback loop between body and soul. And this relationship between body and soul continues all the way into eternity. There is a link that is retained between the body and the soul after death. When you are resurrected on the day of judgment, you are resurrected body and soul. When you enter heaven or the other place, you are resurrected, you, are, you enter it and you experience it body and soul. There is the notion that the, the, you, the form and the matter, just as the cup without any without any tea is the cup without any tea is futile 
the tea without any cup is undrinkable. Both require each other. And this is a fundamental notion because it points to a holisticness that the general philosophy of medicine does not allow or does not explicitly acknowledge. To give you an idea, most of the ideas, uh, most of ideas or theories of alternative medicine, rather than Western medicine, are based on the notion that the body affects the soul. <coughs> See a cup without water, water without a cup, so. Thank you very much. Um, are based on the notion, again, of an integral connection between some mysterious life force and the crude physicality of the body. There are a couple of extra things that happen here. What is the first experience of this body and soul? It is the experience of the womb. And the womb is an experience, the womb in Arabic the word is rahim or rahim, <coughs> which is very, very closely connected. In fact, scripturally, it is explicitly connected to the concept of God's mercy. So the very first thing that the soul experiences once it is embodied is the notion of God's mercy as well as the notion of an all-encompassing mercy, a mercy or a love that sustains every single need of the infant. At birth, the child experiences something very different. The child experiences, or the human being experiences, soul experiences, for the very first time, a need. Hypoxia. This is the first experience of the soul. In the, once it is in the body, that the first experience of a need is hypoxia, the lack of oxygen. And so what does the new soul in the newborn baby do? It does this. <gasps> Takes a nice deep breath. What has it learnt? It's learnt about need. It's learnt that it can fulfil its own needs. This is the first experience of need and the first experience of how that need is fulfilled. It's fulfilled by taking a breath. Baby cries, baby is fed. What happens then? The soul experiences a need that is fulfilled by someone else. Doesn't matter who is holding it. Doesn't matter who is feeding it. The need is fulfilled. From a theological perspective then, the soul has an experience of unity. The soul then has an experience of need that comes from multiplicity. It has the experience of fulfilling its own need, and it has the experience of its needs being fulfilled by many. To put that another way, Iman, Kufr, and Shik. And these are fundamental experiences that then propel the soul on its journey forwards. So what you're looking at here is a psychogenesis. It's those very, very earliest understandings that the soul has that start to shape its personality. Every soul is put into a different body. We all have different DNA. There are aspects of our DNA that lead to the development of certain traits, and here is where structure comes in. Why are some children naturally generous and some children naturally selfish? Why are some children naturally placid and other children naturally... Um, uh, quite active, right? The, is this about the soul, or <coughs> is it about the soul-body interaction? <coughs> the other important thing here is the notion of the nafs shaitan. I'm, I'm sure I must yeah, be running yeah, out of time. Yeah, now. yeah, about seven minutes. Okay, so is that the the notion of the nafs shaitan? There is a fascinating hadith uh, statement of the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings upon him, which I'll summarize. What he said is that the when the child is born. A devil is injected into them, is inserted into them. That devil runs through the pathways of your blood. Yajri majradem. All right. The effect of this soul, this of this this shaitan, the devil, a dark passenger, if you like informs later on, from an Islamic understanding, the notion of what is known in psychology as a negative automatic thought. An autochthonous thought that comes into your head. And then you start to build on that thought. So the idea in psychology is that you, it begins with an automatic thought. 
That is to say, a thought you have not consciously thought of <coughs> just appears. How do you build around that foundation stone to create a belief, to create an understanding and so forth? Where does that initial thought come from? Where does I mentioned about Iman, which is faith? I mentioned about uh, disbelief or rejection of, of faith, which is kufr in Arabic means ingratitude. And ingratitude means specifically um, enjoyment of the blessing without acknowledge or the, the blessing blinding you from the bestower of the blessing. All right, the idea that my needs are fulfilled, who cares where the, the need was fulfilled from? All right, this is, this is also like another very important uh, concept that we need to understand, which is why when people say to me, the famous question, do you deal with jinns very much? That's my, that's my number one question from, from, from Muslims, is do you deal with jinns? And I say, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah? Meaning what? Meaning this aspect of you, because it is you, it's, it's alluded to in the very last verse of the Quran, min al jinnati wa nas, that you seek protection from the whisperer within. And that whisperer within is both min al jinn, it is from the jinn, wa nas, and man. Because when this devil is inserted into you, that devil, you, you have not yet realized that you are different from your mother. You've not individuated yet. So when you grow up, what do you have? Well, you have a voice whispering inside. And that voice doesn't say, as Baudelaire, I think it was, who said that the greatest trick, the biggest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. I talk to my patients sometimes and I say, you know that voice inside you? that says, I am stupid, I am useless, nobody loves me, I'm going to be a failure. Yeah? You believe that because of the pronoun. Because it's I. So it must be my thought. And what I'm going to tell you is, that's not your thought. That's the voice of the devil within. That was placed in you before you could differentiate between your thought and the thought of the devil. And you've grown up having internalized that thought. And this is something that we know about. This happens <coughs> in psychology all of the time. A person who has been bullied all of their life, what happens? You are useless, you are this, you they're told this. When they leave that damaging relationship, what happens? It becomes, I am useless, I am, I am, I am. They have internalized the trauma. They have internalized the abuse and now inflict that abuse on themselves. <coughs> it's a very similar notion, but it occurs at a much more fundamental stage of the development of the human being. So what we have is, a, is, is the idea of the human being being a construct. We have an instinctual nature, we have a rational nature, we have a spiritual stroke emotional nature. Then we have the external stroke internal influences <coughs> that are not a part of our nature but are so uh, attached to our natures that we can't tell them apart. One positive, one negative. The whisper of the devil, the whisper of the all merciful. And when you have an interaction between the whisper of the devil and the, uh, and, the inst and the instinctual nature, you get a particular outcome. And uh, when you have a reaction between the whisper of the devil and the rational nature, you have a particular negative outcome, and so on and so forth. Same for the positives. I'm now speeding <coughs> through because I can hear the noise going on. Yeah. Yeah. The other last question, so this is, this is just this thoughts to leave you with, really, in terms of how we can proceed from this core to construct a model of health, well-being, un, um, ill health, and, uh, and a lack of well-being from a central epistemological or, on, or rather ontological core. The great problem we have in mental health, generally speaking, is that we work from the outwards in. We start with symptoms and then try to retroactively <coughs> assemble models, assemble illnesses, and so forth, um, or uh, construct syndromes 
that we can then apply treatments to. Psychologists, I have to say, tend to do this stuff a lot better than psychiatrists do because they try to start with the inside and then work out, rather than the out working in. Right? What we have, however, here is a conception of the soul <coughs> directly relevant to the notion of uh, the notion of the human being, <coughs> which is which which can where you can see clear pathways, which I don't unfortunately have the time to show you now, but clear pathways to the development of order and disorder, function and dysfunction. And the last thing I want to talk about is the notion of function and dysfunction. How does one <coughs> determine? that a thing is a disorder. In order for something to be dysfunctional, it must be, therefore, not, um, uh, not <coughs> fulfilling its function. I mentioned about that X before, and I said the, first, the bottom half of the Xs are the origins. They come from very different origins in terms of how we conceptualize the soul, the mind, whatever. In terms of purposes, the, what is the purpose of the human being from a materialistic or a secular perspective? That's a great question. To be happy, I suppose, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property stroke <laughs> cross out happiness. All right? <coughs> or, from the Islamic perspective, the purpose of the human being is to know God. How one goes about, how, how well the soul is going about fulfilling that purpose will determine the degree of function or dysfunction. Right? One of the things that is absolutely fascinating about the Islamic approach to the psychology of ethics is that it is, it is, it is phrased in terms of happiness and unhappiness. Contentment versus discontentment. The idea that the saved soul is a happy soul, is a contented soul, when God calls the souls back to himself, right at the end of the Quran, we have this passage, Ya ila O soul at peace with itself. This is the self, this is the saved soul. <coughs> o soul at peace. Return to your Lord, pleasing and pleased. <coughs> Contenting and well contented. The idea that the soul that is at peace is both content and it is contenting to God, i.e. there is a relationship <coughs> between ethics and happiness. We see this in other traditions as well. The idea, uh, um, as the Prophet Muhammad mentioned, man la yarham la yurham, the one who, uh, the one who does not show mercy. Well, I'll give you three translations. The one who does not show mercy has not been shown mercy. Past. The one who does not show mercy does not. Who does not show mercy is not shown mercy. Present. The one who does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. Future. Why? What makes a person unmerciful? Abuse. Childhood experiences, poor nurture, maybe the, 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 the fact that they are like that and mercy is the highest of human, highest of human virtues when it, con when it concerns creation. Why can't a person be like that? Maybe because of their upbringing, maybe they weren't shown that mercy when they were young. If you don't show mercy, you will not be shown mercy means what? Means that holding on to resentment, frustration, anger, depression, all of these things, if you hold on to these things, what happens? You yourself become unhappy. Forgiveness, for example, benefits the forgiver. Forgiveness is letting go of the hurt. It's why we feel lighter when we have been, we have taken the, taken the high road, if you like. And the last, which is about the future, is relation to how that soul will be viewed by God on, on, on the Day of Judgment. This, is a, this, this has interesting parallels and, in fact, experimental parallels in the practice of compassion-focused therapy, where the idea is that you focus on the receipt of compassion and, more importantly, on the bestowal of compassion as a means to remove your own unhappiness. How do you deal with unhappiness? Be good to others. 
Studies have shown, fMRI imaging studies in fact, have shown that people who have practiced these forms of meditation, their inverted commas, and I really have to use inverted commas, their happiness centers, the area of the brain that in severe depression is severely hypoactive, people who have practiced compassion-focused meditation for years and years and years, that same area of the brain is hyperactive. You can meditate your way to changing your brain structure and function. You can think. You can, you can mould your brain by thinking. And that is a fascinating thought, which, which I would like to leave you. And I apologise for not being able to through everything, but I think my time is now probably well and truly up. These were some scattered thoughts. I really appreciate your comments. I appreciate your patience. Um, um, and I look forward to hearing from you, so please forgive me if I've said anything wrong. And, um, and thank you for, for listening. And again, thank you for being invited.